So my name's Ashley, I'm an emergency medicine registrar in North London and this lecture will be on lung ultrasound. So as we go through this lecture we're going to talk a little bit about why we do lung ultrasound, we'll talk a little bit about how we do lung ultrasound and how we interpret the findings of a lung ultrasound. We'll go through the stages of performing the actual lung ultrasound, so the practical aspects, and then we'll talk about the appearances of both normal lung and the common pathologies that you might see in your practice. So why do we do lung ultrasound? Why not just rely on the chest x-ray? Well, there are several reasons for this. The first is that it's a, a test that we can do rapidly. We can do a comprehensive lung ultrasound in under five minutes, and we can do it at the bedside. The patient doesn't need to move for their x-ray, and we don't need to bring an x-ray machine to the patient. Um, we also know that lung ultrasound has a diagnostic accuracy of between 90 and 100 percent for all causes of acute respiratory failure and we know that for most pathologies lung ultrasound either has as good uh, test characteristics as chest x-ray or better. So how do we interpret lung ultrasound? How do we integrate that with the rest of our clinical assessment? I think the things to remember is that our point of care ultrasound scan is a focused assessment and it's a focused assessment that will essentially be, be used to answer very specific questions. Is there evidence of heart failure? Is there evidence of infection? And then we use our ultrasound scan as a rule in. So practically, how do we do a lung ultrasound? So you can use all three of the probes. You can use the high frequency linear probe. Um, you can use the curvilinear, the low frequency probe, or you can even use the phased array probe that we would typically use for our echocardiography. The linear probe will increase your resolution, but it has reduced penetration, so you don't get as deep an image as you would with the curvilinear. And in my experience, the curvilinear probe is probably the most suitable to look at the deeper parts of the lung, but also to look at the pleural line and the more peripheral parts of the lung. We need to think a little bit about how we position our patients for this assessment. We want to scan at the front, we want to scan at the back, um, and we need to think about how we can get our patient into the right position. So this could be lying supine, it could be sitting forwards for the posterior zones. Um, you must also remember that air and fluid are both position dependent. So air will rise to the top of the chest and fluid will be sinking to the bottom part of the chest. So if your patient is supine, air will be at the highest point of the chest, so the fifth to sixth intercostal spaces. But if your patient is sat upright, then that air will rise to the first to second intercostal spaces. When we talk about our probe placement, we will either be using the linear or curvilinear probe, but the probe will always be orientated in the same way. So the probe mark will be oriented, oriented to the head and the probe will be in a longitudinal section. And what we want to see at the top of the image and the bottom of the image are two rib shadows and in between that will be your pleural line and your lung. This diagram here demonstrates the 12 lung zones. So we have four squares on either side that would demonstrate the anterior lung zones and we'll scan posteriorly in a similar way. And then the blue boxes indicate the lateral zones. We'll now move on to discussing what a normal lung looks like. So when we talk about normal lung, there are four things that we, we need to remember and four things that we'll talk about over the next few slides. So the first is the concept of the bat sign, and this is something that you may read about, um, and it's just a description of the normal appearance of the lung. We will talk about lung sliding, and lung sliding refers to the movement of the visceral pleura with normal breathing. And then we'll talk about two types of artifact. The first artifact is a horizontal line that we see in normal lung called the A line, and this is a reverberation. So this is the ultrasound beam reflecting off the pleural line. And then we'll talk about comet tail artifacts. So these are small bleb-like artifacts that you see on the pleural surface of normal lung. And these are very small artifacts, and these are very different to B lines, a pathological artifact that we'll talk about a little later. So here's a schematic of a normal lung. We see the ultrasound probe and then we see what our image would look like in schematic. This is the bat sign. So you see two ribs with two rib shadows beneath and between that you have the pleural line. And it's the ribs and the pleural line that make this so-called bat structure. 
We can also see some A lines in this schematic, and these are, like I say, reverberation artifacts of that plural line. So we'll run through all of the things that you'll see in the normal lung. So first of all, that bat sign. So this is the bat sign here. Then we'll, we see two rib shadows. We see the plural line. And then we see these reverberation artifacts, the A lines. And this is how a normal anterior lung window would look like with a linear probe. And here we see the schematic and the ultrasound image side by side demonstrating all of those normal lung features. So we now move on to a video of the normal lung. This is an anterior lung window taken with a linear probe, so a high frequency probe. And in this video we'll see a rib, we'll see a rib shadow. We see some comet tail artifacts emanating from the pleural line and we'll see some A lines and we'll see this lung sliding. So you'll see a shimmering at the pleural line and this is movement of the visceral pleura with normal breathing. So, and this is a normal lung window from the, at the lateral side now. So we're looking at the costophrenic angle at that base of the lung. And here we see a kidney, liver, we see a couple of rib shadows, and we see what's called mirroring. So we see mirroring of the liver architecture above the diaphragm, and that's normal. So that's what we would see in normal lung. Moving on to some of the pathologies that we'll see, what, we'll see, what we see is either an absence of the normal artifacts, or we see artifacts that are pathological. We never see lung tissue, we are only looking at lung artifacts. So the first thing to talk about is pneumothorax, probably the most common pathology that we use lung ultrasound for. We look for the absence of lung sliding. We'll talk a little bit about the stratosphere or barcode sign, and this is, this is something we see in M mode, so motion mode. And we'll talk about the lung point. One of the caveats to using lung ultrasound to assess for pneumothorax is that you can get false positive results in patients with COPD. So here we see a, a schematic demonstrating pneumothorax, so air between the two pleural lines. Whilst the lung is still inflating and deflating, because the two pleural lines are separated by air, we do not see lung sliding. Here we see a video where there is no lung sliding. So we see some of the normal artifacts, we see some comet tails, we see some A lines, and as you should, we see some rib shadows and some ribs, but we don't see sliding of that pleural line. Comparing that to normal, so this is the video we've seen previously, but here you'll see a very clear difference from the previous video, and here you see lung sliding. So we can put M mode through our lung ultrasound images, and we get a slightly different graphic representation of the same information. Here we see the movement of the pleural line over time. And this is the seashore sign, so this is normal. And what we see is a, lo a lot of straight lines in our M-mode image, where there is no movement, and th this represents no movement of the soft tissues. And then we see a sandy appearance beneath that, and that's created by the movement of the pleural line. Comparing that to a patient here with pneumothorax, we see just straight lines over time, and that's because there's no movement at the pleural line. There is another very specific finding of pneumothorax. The absence of lung sliding is very sensitive, but it's not always specific. The lung point is very specific. And the lung point represents the point at which the inflated lung and deflated lung come together. So here we see lung sliding in half of the image, and no lung sliding in the other half of the image. The lung point is essentially the point at which the lung is inflated and moves to being deflated. And you can see how the lung point on ultrasound is represented by a CT scan here. Moving on to our next pathology, and that's talk, we'll talk a little bit about interstitial syndrome and pulmonary edema. Now, typically when we talk about pulmonary edema, we talk about B-lines, some people call these lung rockets. This is another type of artifact, and this is a pathological artifact. If you have more than three B-lines in any one lung zone, that's abnormal and represents what we call interstitial syndrome. 
more than three bee lines in more than two zones on both sides of the chest suggests that there is a diffuse interstitial syndrome and in our population the most likely reason for that is acute pulmonary edema. In some pathologies you get focal bee lines and this is because there is inflammatory fluid in the interstitium and you get this with infective pathologies like a pneumonia or with a viral pneumonitis such as in COVID-19. We now move on to some videos of bee lines. Here we see bee lines with an irregular pleural line likely to be infective. Here we see bee lines in a linear image and as you can see these bee lines they emanate from the pleural line and they extend all the way down your image and that's very different to the comet tail artifact. Here is another video taken with a curvilinear probe and we're seeing three rib spaces and we can see bee lines again emanating all the way down that image all the way through the entire depth. In severe interstitial syndrome the bee lines will become confluent and this is a video here of confluent bee lines. So now we'll talk a little bit about pneumonia and the signs that you'll see in pneumonia on ultrasound but this is a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture. So some of the things that you might see are unilateral lung rockets or bee lines so this is focal bee lines not diffuse bee lines. We may see the tissue-like sign or the shred sign and this is the border of consolidated lung with normal lung and then we may see dynamic or static air bronchograms and you sometimes see the absence of lung sliding. In COVID-19 the typical picture is that you don't see any A-line so those normal artifacts are replaced by pathological artifacts. We see patchy bilateral bee lines we see subpleural consolidation, we see an irregular or thickened pleural line, and then these can also progress to low bar pneumonias, and we see the signs that we've just mentioned for pneumonia. Here is a video of subpleural consolidation. So this is right at the pleural line, and we're seeing irregular pleural line with subpleural consolidation. Moving on to pleural effusion, this is a pathology that we commonly look for with lung ultrasound. In trauma, we may look for a blood in the thorax, so a hemothorax, and in medical problems, we may, may look for pleural fluid. Often with a pleural effusion, we won't see the mirror sign, so the normal mirror sign that we saw previously, where the liver architecture was mirrored in the thorax, will be absent. We'll also see something called the spine sign, and we'll, move, we'll come on to that and explain that a little bit more in one of the coming slides. This is a schematic of a curvilinear approach to looking at a pleural effusion. And in this schematic, we see the liver and the diaphragm, and we see collapsed lung within a large area of black hypoechoic pleural fluid. We also see the vertebral bodies at the bottom of the image and we see vertebral bodies extending beyond the diaphragm. Ordinarily, we wouldn't see that. So if you see vertebral bodies extending beyond the diaphragm, that's a positive spine sign. And it's telling you that there is pathology at the lung base. So here you see some examples of both the absence of the mirror sign and the presence of the spine sign. Both of, both of these cases are pleural effusions. In the picture on the left hand side, where you would ordinarily see mirroring of that liver architecture, we're seeing an anechoic black fluid. In the picture on the right hand side, we're seeing vertebral bodies extend beyond the diaphragm. And that spine sign suggests that there is pathology in the lung base. And we can see here that there's that anechoic black pleural fluid. Here we see another pleural effusion. And here we see another video of a pleural effusion. So we see the collapsed lung within an anechoic pleural fluid, and you can see those vertebral bodies extending beyond that diaphragm. Again, positive spine sign. So that brings us to the end of the pathologies that we'll discuss in this lecture. And this was an introduction to lung ultrasound. There's certainly things that we've covered in some depth that you may want to go and read about a little bit further. To summarise, we've spoken a little bit about why we do lung ultrasound and the evidence for using lung ultrasound at the bedside. And we've spoken about how we integrate lung ultrasound with our ordinary clinical management.
we've spoken a little bit about how you do a lung ultrasound practically, the 12 lung zones. And then we've spoken about the artifacts that we see in normal lung, the appearance of lung sliding, and then we've spoken a little bit about the common pathologies that we might be able to pick up with lung ultrasound at the bedside.